Good morning, everyone. This morning, we are back in the book of Ephesians. And as we continue on through Ephesians, now we're going to transition into chapter 5, so we are making our way through the book. Let me read the text and pray, and then we'll begin with the sermon. The text I'm reading from the Lexham English Bible, Ephesians 4, 32 through 5, 2. Become kind toward one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as also God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, become imitators of God as beloved children and live in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us for an offering and sacrifice to God for a fragrant smell, for a fragrant smell. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you for your graciousness and love and mercy. And may we take your command for us to be like you seriously and ask you for the grace to change us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we have a section that's going to cover what in theology we call communicable attributes of God. So we'll be talking about that. And I mentioned it to Eric this morning after Sunday school, and he said, well, that's interesting because next week I have a sermon that's going to talk about incommunicable attributes of God. So we're going to cover both of those. I'll mention what Eric's going to be talking about a little bit today. But this is telling us things about God and his nature that he, by his spirit, imparts, excuse me, imparts to us and into us that we're commanded to live in, like being loving and gracious, forgiving. Those are the key ones we're talking about here. There are many others. So that'll be our topic. Let's go to the first part of Ephesians 4.32. 432a. Become kind toward one another, compassionate. Become in the Greek, is imperative. That's how the Greek language indicates such things. In English, we'd put an exclamation mark after something to do that, but they did it by having uh, the imperative. And so that's how we know what that is. So we're told to do this. And one, we had a really great discussion in Sunday school this morning, and Thank you for everyone who participated, and thanks to Eric for being able to handle things on the fly and teach us. But I thought about how appropriate that uh, discussion was about how God commands things that we need to do, but which, in fact, could not be done if God didn't do a work in us. That's kind of what the discussion was about. And so God is commanding us to be a way that would be like him, that will only happen by a work of the Spirit within us, and God uses me. So the command is important. We need to take it seriously. And I'm going to always go back to the context of Ephesians where it talks about the one new man. Knowing what we do about how difficult it was, if we read the book of Acts and Galatians and many other places, how difficult it was for the church to become that one new man comprised of redeemed Jews and Gentiles. Because in the ancient world, the way the Jews lived in their synagogues and in the temple Judaism was still going on in Jerusalem, so they still had the pilgrim feast at that time. And the way the Gentiles lived in their polytheistic world of false deities and rampant immorality and things that would be totally disgusting to a Jew. So how is there going to be a church that's one new man built on the foundation of Christ as the cornerstone and the apostles and prophets? It's going to take a work of the Spirit to change everyone so that the Jews are not trusting anything but the finished work of Christ, and the Gentiles are not trusting anything 
but the finished work of Christ and all together are under the lordship of Christ and living according to that so that there would be compatibility in the church. And so it's essential that we don't have those battles going on. If the Jews are going to be disgusted with any Gentile, how, how are we going to have the one new man? And if the Gentiles are going to be anti-Semitic or what other really bad things were in the ancient world, that's not going to work e e either. We have to be changed. So this is an imperative. And he's describing, and as we'll see in this sermon, communicable attributes of God, which we as Christians must display by his grace. And one of those is kindness. As I'll show you in one of the applications, God himself displays kindness as one of his attributes. And as he saved us, he's called us to show this kindness. And I have here on the slide, Luke 635, that'll be part of that application I told you about. So we are also uh, in remembering, it's very important, the last sermon we talked about bitterness and that we were warned about being bitter, that we shouldn't be bitter. And I mentioned in uh, Hebrews 12 about the root of bitterness that we don't want in us. We don't want to be bitter people. So it's important that rather than being bitter or angry or hostile, we be kind and compassionate. So this is the alternative to what was warned against in the last section of Ephesians that we preached on last week. Now, this word compassionate is really, I think, kind of a cool word, but maybe that's just because I'm a farm boy. And the reason I say that is that it's very uh, graphic in the Greek. The word compassionate is based on a word for innards. Okay, like if you butchered something, you'd have the innards, the bowels. And maybe in, if you remember the King James, it says bowels of compassion. Have you seen that before in the King James Bible? That we should have bowels of compassion. And um, here I brought along that Greek. It's easier for me to read it that way than the trans uh, transliteration. The word here is eusplachnos. Eusplachnos. Splachnon is innards. You, EU, is good. So we're supposed to have good innards. And now you don't get good innards by taking Tums, but you get them from the Holy Spirit. And it's a word that means uh, compassionate. And that particular word, uh, having good innards or bowels, is used a couple other times. And one of the places it's used, if you want to jot this down, is 1 Peter 3, 8. I'll cite that. 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. And finally, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, showing mutual affection. Here's our word, compassionate and humble. And... Notice that Peter has a few different terms here. Later, we'll have Paul mentioning other things in Ephesians. We have the list of the fruits of the Spirit. And so there's various verses that tell different things that are character qualities, attitudes, spiritual fruits, and things that are God's work in the Christian by his Spirit. And these are listed, not to be comprehensive, but to show us what it looks like to be the one new man. What does the church look like? It looks like people who are kind, who love one another, who care about each other, who forgive one another, and are willing to cry out to God to change us because surely we need it continually. We need God to work in us. Kind here is an adjective, krestos, and the noun form of that word that's used as an adjective here is 
found earlier in Ephesians, Ephesians 2 7, that we covered earlier. Let me give that by way of review. Ephesians 2 7. In order that he might show in the coming ages the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. So in the ages to come, God will show his kindness displayed by what he's doing in his church that will be consummated when we're caught up to be with him and in the eternal order this kindness will always be there it's a communicable attribute of God and we don't want to despise that see the world despises it Literally, the world despises the kindness of God. And you hear God's name taken in vain. You hear our belief system mocked. And these things despise. It says in Romans 2, 4, Or do you despise the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? The world doesn't know God and despises people who talk like we are here about how we ought to be, and they think we're fools. And Paul is saying to them, they don't realize as they curse God and blaspheme his name that they're actually despising a God who is at the very same time showing kindness to them. How do we know that? Well, how many of you know that if somebody shakes their fist at God and curses him, fire doesn't come down out of heaven, does it? Why is it that all this stuff goes on and God doesn't do anything about it? That's the subject of the lament literature in the Old Testament. And the answer is that God is granting time for people to repent. The kindness of God leads you to repentance. God has ordained that people can live out their lives on the earth and have time to enjoy the good fruits of the earth. But the point of it is to lead to repentance, to come to Christ and forgiveness of sins. Let's go to the last part of this verse. Forgiving one another just as also... God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgiving is actually a little different word in the Greek, and I don't want to uh, be too laborious here, but I think it was necessary. I looked at the Greek and I thought, why are they translating this forgiving when there's a word for forgiving that was that's used elsewhere? And every English translation I had translated the same way. And so I was looking at this and I thought, well, it says what it says. But the word is a root of the word grace. It's from the, the root word grace, I mean. And, and it's really saying gracing one another as God has graced you or shown grace. I think it's implied that if God is showing grace, he's also forgiving. And uh, I looked at some of my theological sources and one of one that I really respect, Harold Horner, Honer, thought it should be translated gracious as well. And so let me cite him. I saw it myself, and I so I looked at my commentaries, and somebody else saw it. So I'm going to tell you what it says here, and I'll also tell you where it came from. And then in our application, we'll look at something where God is showing grace. Dr. Horner says, why... Uh, why gracious is the best translation. Quote, quote, there are three reasons to render it being gracious to one another, says Honer. First, to be gracious is not only the normal meaning of the word, but it is also the most suited to the context. Graciousness is the antithesis, says Honer, of bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, and abusive speech. In other words, bitterness is counteracted still citing Honer, by a gracious attitude, anger and wrath 
are counteracted by a gracious disposition and shouting and abusive speech are counteracted by gracious speaking. And I'll stop the quote right there so I don't belabor that, but I really think we need to know that the word really means being gracious. But those who are gracious also forgive. You could rightly ask, well, then why do all the English translations have forgive? And my answer is, I do not know. And I haven't made a Bible translation, and I'm not equipped to do so. But I can preach and tell you uh, that that's behind it. Karizomai, karizomai <clears throat> is the word. And part of that is the word charis, which is the word in the Greek for grace. The same word, karizomai, is used by Paul in Romans 8.32. Romans 8.32, where Paul says, Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, together with him, freely give us all things? Freely give, in Romans 8.32, is the same word used here, charizomai, graced us. He graces us with all things. If God sent his son to die for our sins, he most certainly will grace us. Grace being gift from God with all things. And this too, graciousness is a communicable attribute of God. A communicable attribute of God. It says in Luke 7 42 about two people forgiven, one many, many things. And Jesus said when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love the more? Well, the answer is the one forgiven the most. But there is our word, charizomai. So I think that's a good translation. God has graciously forgiven us. And our offense toward God, if we've come to Jesus Christ, the way we were without him, the way we despised him before was horrible. And the amount of debt was so great that we were facing eternal death. But God graciously, for those who believe in Jesus, forgives all of it. It all is under the blood. And therefore, having been recipients of unmerited favor of kindness and grace, it's wrong for us to not be gracious to one another. That's Paul's point. I think it's a very powerful one. See, earlier in Ephesians 1, 7, there is the actual word for forgiveness. It says, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches, riches of his grace. There the term is aphasis which means release. So forgiveness is often used, a different word is used to describe it, aphasis, right in Ephesians. So that's why I think we should translate this. Um, great, but, you know, being gracious is a good way to say it. Gracing is typically not something we say in English. This moral command is grounded in God's action. Let's go to chapter 5 and verse 1. Here we get the idea of communicable attributes of God. Ephesians 5.1, Therefore become imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators of God as beloved children. And this is certainly very, very important, and it's a command, again, another imperative, and it brings up this theological category. Some people might say, well, why teach theology in church? And my answer is, why would anyone not teach theology in church? Because there's a real crisis. I read, I've been reading a manuscript for some folks who were, were asking me to look at it and see if I'd endorse it. But in it, they were decrying the fact that theology is not taught in many churches and that the people growing up in those churches become prey for false teachers because they don't know what they're supposed to believe. 
They never hear about it. And so when all the pagan religions are taught in Bible colleges, we've written about that, they don't know what's wrong. They don't get it. They don't see it because they're not taught. So the categories, communicable and incommunicable attributes of God, are valid. Why? Well, look at this one. Be imitators of God. What do we know about God? God created the entire universe out of nothing. So when we're told to be an imitator of God, are we being told to go create a universe out of nothing? No. I would assume we all would agree that we can't do that. So omnipotence and omniscience are attributes of God that are uniquely God's attributes. God is unique. And there are certain things about God that are always true about God, but that the creature doesn't share. There are other attributes of God that are shared by humans who are redeemed and are created, which all humans are created in the image of God. So we want to understand what some of those are and discuss that. Next week, Eric will be talking about incommunicable attributes. Today I'm talking about communicable. For example, the Bible says God is love. The Bible says that God loved us. That God so loved the world, he said his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so God in his love is perfectly and completely loving in the greatest sense that love ever has been, can be, and has always been in God. But that doesn't mean that his creatures cannot be loving. And that one of the fruits of the Spirit is love. And so that's why this is a way in which we can be an imitator of God, which is what's talked about here in this context. Now, some theologians uh, that were rationalists or were wanting to fight rationalism with some other philosophy came up with the idea that, well, we can't even talk about this. God is so totally other, he's some t entire different order of being, that anything we say about God is equivocation and meaningless, so we're just blabbering. Blah, blah, blah. Nobody's talking about it. So we just have to take a blind leap of faith, and that's going to be our religion. But our answer to that false theology, as espoused by people like Tillich in the early 20th century, is this. That love, when predicated of God, is certainly of a greater order of love of being than love predicated of a Christian. But that there's an analogical relationship between God being loving and a human being loving. And that it's a meaningful relationship. And that when God says that we ought to be loving because he is, that we know and understand what's being said. And that that's something God can impart into us and work into us. And that it is true and that it's meaningful. So we say to Paul Tillich, we don't agree with you. That's not equivocation. That's actually learning something. Well, how do we learn how the uh, transcendent God is loving? Through actions that God has taken in history to demonstrate it. He sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, God incarnate, into our world, who lived objectively in history a life of love. And who willingly laid down his life to demonstrate what God's love looks like in a way that humans can see. Now, we don't just believe in Jesus as a good example, but he actually bore sins. And his uh, bearing of our sins is substitutionary, and he paid the price for our sin. It was raised on the, uh, from the dead on the third day. So this is how God communicates words, as in on Sinai, words through Jesus, words through his apostles and prophets, 
also in his actions. So we can know love, we can believe that love is real, and we can believe that God can make us loving people. Beloved children here are the building blocks of this church built on the foundation of Christ the cornerstone and his apostles and prophets. And these building blocks are, are drawn from all of the peoples on the face of the earth, whoever believes in Christ. And every one of those people know love, are loved, and are to love one another. And God shows his personal love for each of his adopted children. Ephesians 1.5, we're adopted into the family of God. God chose us and adopted us into his family and made us a part of his beloved people. And therefore, when we're called and told to be imitators of God, it motivates us to be loving people. Now, here's the question. Everybody's going to have it. Everybody. How in the world can I ever do that? Or what do I do when I fail to love? What do I do when there's objective, obvious ways I did not love when I should have loved, but rather became bitter, angry, and so on, as we were talking about last week? And what is the answer? It's always the same. Hebrews 4, 16, we go to the throne of grace to find grace and help and find mercy in our time of need. If we fail to love, it's not the end. There's always Christ who is interceding for us, God who cares about us, and God who will help us. So we, the beloved children of God, if we know him, are loved by God, and he enables us to love one another, and he gives forgiveness to us when we fail to do so. A little review in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. God is a loving God, and that's a communicable attribute of God. So we should show these truths about ourselves, and we should know these truths and treat others in the body as having this same status. I had a bunch of stuff about incommunicable attributes, and I'm not going to teach those right now because Eric's going to do it next week, and I wouldn't have known that had I not asked him. So he got spared a little part of a sermon here. But look forward to next week. Eric will talk about incommunicable attributes. Let's go to walking in love, Ephesians 5, 2. And live in love just as also Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a fragrant smell. Live, very uh, graphic word in the Greek, peripateo, which literally means walk around. And so it's certainly legitimate for some English translations to say walk in love. It's a good translation. It implies that we live in love. The round part is that's how we are. And this obviously would be what it's like to imitate God because Christ loved us, and I've already spoken about that. He gave himself for us. Notice there, I have in red, gave himself for us. On the slide, this is teaching Christ substitutionary sacrifice for sins. For is huper in the Greek, and it means on behalf of. What does that imply? That when Jesus bore all of God's wrath, it, Jesus, the sinless one, fully human, fully God, who had no sin and knew no sin, who perfectly obeyed God, and always did the things that pleased the Father, took the penalty of sin with his shed blood, his death, and bore all of that, who cried out on the cross, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And who was raised on the third day. That was 
for us who pair to no substitution. Why am I belaboring that? Because we're learning theology today. I talked about this Paul Tillich who had a whole different idea. And, and the theologians would say, I'll talk about God as equivocation and meaningless. We reject that. Others say that this substitutionary atonement is unworthy to be preached from pulpits. Because they mock God, even though they're preachers and theologians, and they say, what kind of God is going to kill his own son? And you hear this to this day from people. I can't believe the God of the Bible. I can't believe you Christians. What kind of God is going to kill his own son? That's nonsense. If somebody did that, we'd throw him in jail. What, what are you talking about? And they literally reject the substitutionary atonement and say it has to be taken out of churches and not preached because it's not loving. But those who say these things, and that was very prevalent, especially in the 20th century, but it's still out there. I wrote a book about that as well. Uh, the emergent, the things, everything's evolving into Godhood. Listen, this is the most loving thing that's ever been taught. Far from being unloving, far from being unworthy, there's never been a greater uh, act of love done than Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Because he bore what we couldn't. Because if we bore that ourselves, we'd end up in hell, lost, with no hope. But if he did it for us and we trust what he did, rather than trusting our own works, we find redemption and forgiveness and eternal life. That's the message, and it is loving. Oh, yes, the 20th century, they used to say, oh, that's just slaughterhouse religion. We've got to take all mentions of the blood out of our hymnals. We don't want to hear about this stuff. But frankly, that was laying the groundwork for the sort of literal liberalism that gutted church after church after church across America. Removing the most important essential attribute of the doctrine of salvation and forgiveness of sins because we don't like the substitutionary atonement. And we just think, well, the good Lord will just be happy if we try to go do good things and make the world a better place. But we have no power to do that, and we don't want to do it. We want to serve self. So we need to embrace what the Bible says. And when you see this in faith, through the eyes of faith, you will know that God truly loves you. It's not unkind. It's not cruel. It's God receiving upon his own person, God the Son, the judgment against sin that was due us. As Eric was telling us in Sunday school in Genesis 22, God will provide when he was bringing Isaac up to make the offering. The smell idea, we find that in the language in the Old Testament about the sacrifices that were offered in obedience to God by faith. And I'm going to also delay that. Next week in Sunday school or the week after, I have the next two Sunday schools, I'm going to cover Genesis 8, 20 through 22, which talks about after the flood, Noah built an altar, made a sacrifice, and God smelt it, and it was a soothing fragrance. He accepted it. But then it, there's a promise of what's going to happen on the earth. So when I get to it, I'm going to tell you that God promised there'll be harvest and winter and summer on the earth until the final judgment. You can guess why I'm going to teach that, but it has something to do with climate change doctrines. Just giving you a little hint. <laughs> I'm going to believe the promise of God that if we continue to live on the earth is because of God's kindness and grace. We shouldn't pollute, obviously. But he's going to give us, because he had just destroyed the whole earth with a flood, and he promised to give us a way to raise our families, grow our crops, and feed people. All the way until there's a final judgment of fire. So that will be coming up at Sunday school, and you can ask questions. Let's go to some applications. <clears throat> to be like God, we must be kind and gracious. 
Some of these are pretty, pretty obvious. And the other one here, only Christ's sacrifice for sins is acceptable to God. And so I'm going to look at some passages and ask you to look with me as we contemplate how the whole counsel of God is coherent and consistent, and we can learn how the Bible fits together and all that it says. Let's go to Luke. You might want to turn to this because I'm going to cover more verses that are on the slide. Okay, we're in Luke. Um, the slide starts with Luke 6.35, but I want you to think about also going back to verse 32. So turn with me to Luke 6, and we'll start with verse 32, and then we'll read up through what's on the slide. Luke 6, beginning with verse 32, a teaching of Jesus. It says, And if you love those who love you, what kind of credit is that to you? Jesus says, For even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33, And if you do good to those who do good to you, what kind of credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. Verse 34, Luke 6, And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive back, what kind of credit is is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners so they may get back an equal amount. Nowadays, they get back much more than an equal amount, but uh, thinking of their world then. Now, let's go to what's on the slide here. But love your enemies. This is the alternative to being like the sinners, always expecting something back. What's in it for me? Luke 6, 35, 36. But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself, notice, is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So what we see as history rolls on, and we see it every single day, every day, that Christ doesn't come and we're still in the church age, every day we look out and if we're thinking biblically, we'll see God is being kind to ungrateful and evil men. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. All persons are allowed to live out what life they have, enjoying the green grass, the seasons, the birds that come in the spring, which we're looking forward to, but it's a long ways off. We're here in Minnesota in January, but we can enjoy what we, what we enjoy. And it's not just the Christians who get good things. It doesn't work that way. It isn't like you need rain and there's a drought and the farms are out here and the Christians, the rain hits them and then the sinners, they don't ever get any rain. How many of you know it doesn't work that way? And it's not that the tornado only hits the house of the sinners. We all live in the same world with this same fallen nature. But God is showing kindness. Now the difference is, thankful and grateful people are seeing God's kindness in this. And they're thankful. We thank God when we sit down to eat food because we're acknowledging that God is the source of all things. And we're not bitter by God's grace saying, why does somebody else have better stuff to eat than I do? Christians aren't to think that way. We're to think, thank you, Lord, that I have food and thank you that we have the goodness of God seen in everyday life. And so the context is God is giving with no strings attached, as the slide title says here. And we don't expect somebody has to give something back to us if we did something good for them. We do graciously give and receive within the body of Christ. Luke 6, 36 uh, says here that God is merciful. 
that word merciful, oitrim, excuse me, oitrimon, is found in this verse and then also in James 5.11, which uh, only twice in the New Testament. And it, however, that same word for merciful is found several times in the Old Testament Greek translation that was commonly used, including the very important passage, Exodus 34, 6. Exodus 34, 6 is where Moses is on Sinai and God comes in a theophany and reveals himself to Moses at the occasion of the giving of the Ten Commandments and God speaks words that Moses hears and can understand. Okay, there's our idea of communicable. God communicates, and he explains there on Sinai his nature. And let me cite what God said about himself to Moses in this glorious theophany on Sinai, Exodus 34, 6. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. That's what God said about himself. Moses hid in the cleft of the rock and only partially see lest he die. And what did God say about himself? He's kind, he's gracious, he's merciful, and so on. Now he does go on to say he's just as well. But that word is used here. As far as the Greek translation of the Old Testament, I realize Hebrew is the inspired text, but a lot of times the Greek is cited in the New Testament, which is written in Greek. This term, like tree moan, is not that prevalent in the Septuagint, but it's found also in Jonah 4 and verse 2. Now, I talked about Jonah last week. Jonah 4 and verse 2. And I love that passage because... Jonah really has a bad attitude, and he's portrayed in the book bearing his name of having his own bad attitude. So why was Jonah so upset in Jonah? Because he knew God was going to forgive the Ninevites. He didn't like them. But what did Jonah say? I'm going to cite this to you. Jonah 4 and verse 2, because this word shows up in Jonah 4 too. He prayed to the Lord. This is Jonah. Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents concerning sending disaster. Jonah says to God, I know what you're like. You're going to forgive him. That's why I didn't want to go. That's why I ended up in this ship. And he went down to Tarshish, down to the ship, down, down to the sea, down to the ship, and then down into the sea, and down into the whale, or the sea monster. And he got spit up on shore. Well, I'm here. I might as well preach to him. God forgave him. This passage, Exodus 34, 6, is mentioned a number of times throughout the Old Testament. When things got really bad and questions came up, the Jewish people knew what God told Moses and they recited it. And here, even Jonah, who's complaining about it, recites it. I knew you'd forgive them. Bummer. Now we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to spread the gospel, being excited about the fact that God is a loving, compassionate God who forgives sins. That motivates us. So that was Jonah. Now I have a couple more slides in there about substitution. Very important that we understand what the Bible says about this so we understand God's nature and we understand our own salvation if we're Christians. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, 
which could never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. This is alluding to Psalm 110 and verse 1, the Old Testament verse that's most often cited throughout the New Testament. Psalm 110 and verse 1. is thereby shown to be the most important Messianic verse in the Old Testament, or one of the most important, certainly the most cited. And there's a lot of commentary in Hebrews about Psalm 110 and verse 1. Let me read Psalm 110 and verse 1 to you. A declaration of Yahweh to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Certainly uh, implications about the deity of Christ there as well. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So there's a contrast with the offerings that were ordained under the old covenant whereby they had various offerings, various blood offerings, various grain offerings, various different kind of animals that were offered, plus the Day of Atonement. There was a continual offering going on in temple, the temple system. And the priests were standing to do their duties. And there's a word used here in the Greek that's only found in the book of Hebrews. And uh, it's translated here repeatedly. Repeatedly. And uh, perpetually be another way of saying it. But it just kept going on. It kept going on. Repeatedly. Offering sacrifices. Over and over. But what is done for one time is done into perpetuity. I'm going to show you one more slide on this. This is one of the most important things you need to know about biblical Christianity. What we believe and our eternal hope is grounded in what God did in Christ once for all. Into perpetuity. We don't have to go make sacrifices. This invalidates the mass. It's not valid. Any religion is telling you you've got to do it over and over. Christ has to be sacrificed over and over and over and over and over. Whoever says that, never read the book of Hebrews, or if they did, they could care less what it says. Because they ignore it, and they put the people in bondage, forcing them to go for more sacrifices continually, and there's no hope that it's ever totally done unless there's more and more giving and more and more sacrifices. But God says, no, I've done it once for all. Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down, which is in contrast to perpetually standing. Standing, offering, standing, offering, standing, offering. Christ offered, ascended, sat down at the place of majesty and power and authority, the right hand of God, as prophesied in Psalm 110 and verse 1. And there at the mercy seat, we can go to him and ask for whatever we need. So there is a contrast. Every priest stood daily. is an antithetical parallel relationship to he has sat down forever. Dear ones, God has called us to trust him who sat down forever. You can go to priests. They may have better buildings, more smells and bells, more interesting robes, but they, have, they offer their sacrifices over and over and over, standing offering, standing offering, standing offering, all around the globe, 24-7, standing offering, standing offering, standing offering. They've recreated what God did away with, and it can never take away sins. You'll spend your entire life serving the papal system and never have a resolution. Or you can believe the promises of God that are done once for all and be forgiven. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. And no one can take away that forgiveness of sins. Let me make a statement that I put in my notes here. 
We need to trust the finished work of Christ who died once for all for sins and have him, uh, I'm going to cite the Greek word, you've heard enough of those today, but periareo, which means to go around and take up, take away sins that the Old Testament sacrifices could not. He lifts and removes, that's what that word means, lifts and removes sins and thus makes decisive expiation for sin. Decisive purgation is another way to say it. Expiate is when God takes it away. Covering is another word. Here it's expiate, to take away. Who did this? Who did this? Jesus Christ. What does Hebrews say about him? Let me cite Hebrews 1.3. You can jot it down. There's not time to turn to it. Let me just cite it. Who is the radiance of his glory, the, the representation of his essence, sustaining all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification for sins through him, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Hebrews 1, 3, alluding to Psalm 110 and verse 1. There it is, once for all. I've mentioned that Jesus Christ is, the, is God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, who came into our world, totally sinless, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. I've already told you he shed his blood on the cross once for all. He was raised on the third day, as he predicted, and bodily ascended to heaven before witnesses. And there he is, as Hebrews says, at the right hand of God, in the place of honor and authority and power, predicted in Psalm 110, verse 1. What do we need to do today? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. He did it all, but you need to trust him and not yourself. You can't work enough to ever make it right anyhow. Let him forgive what he promised to do by putting your faith in Jesus, repenting, and turning to Christ. One more slide. Today, I honestly, we preach the gospel every Sunday because God adds building blocks to the church one by one as people come to faith. And he uses means, and the means is the gospel preached. So, uh, excuse me, more commentary on Psalm 110, but here it says, Hebrews 10, 13, and 14, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. For all time here, Dianeke, neck case, which is used four times in the New Testament, all in Hebrews. We've already seen one of them. It's used in Hebrews 7.3, 10.1, 10.12, 10.14. For all time. Another way of saying once for all. It's so profound. It's, it's just beautiful what God is saying. It can be translated without in interruption, or I have it here, into perpetuity. Why isn't this preached? It's obviously in the Bible. Why isn't it preached more often, I should say? Because I know people preach it all around the world. But religion is about doing more. Do more and try harder. Give, 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 try, try, try. Serve, serve, serve. And in the end, <clears throat> excuse me, in the end, you're still dangling. You don't know where you stand. Religion says do. The gospel says done. Hallelujah. Done. We live, we do, we give. But it's because of what he did for us, not because we're earning anything. Maybe you've spent your life serving a religion. You don't need to. You can believe in Christ who did it all for you. Until here is reminding us of the second coming. He will return and bring judgment to those who are his enemies and salvation to those who are trusting him. This word in, until, an adverbial temporal conjunction, is used in 
Matthew 24, 39, that I preached last week about Noah and the flood. Noah kept building till the flood came. We keep preaching and serving until the promise of God is fulfilled in the future. What do you do in the meantime? Go to God. Let me end with Hebrews 4, 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you're hurting, if you're struggling, and life is very difficult, as it is for all of us, we really need God to help us. And we have a merciful Savior who is there at the right hand of the majesty on high, who hears every single prayer of every person who calls out to him because of his omniscience. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank, for, thank you for your kindness and mercy. And we don't consider ourselves worthy of any of this. So we have to praise you and thank you. It's only right, but Lord, we ask you to work in us that love and kindness and forgiving, gracious attitude that we learned about today. Help us be that way by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. I think I'll continue to use the benediction from Ephesians. Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.